E, let me hide myself in thee. Well, you can turn in your New Testament to the book or the epistle, Paul's epistle to the Hebrews, and uh, we'll look at a few things before we jump into it. But if you have your Bibles, we're going to read the, just the first three verses of chapter 1. So if you want to turn there, I'm sure it'll be up on the screen as well. Your Bible might say that, the epistle of Paul, the apostle to the Hebrews. That's what mine says. Uh, but many of you have verses uh, that you know in this epistle, this letter, that you have memorized. They're very important doctrines of the faith here, but when we uh, look at any book of the Bible or any, anything from the Word of God, we want to make sure we study it in its context, and there's only one true or correct or proper interpretation of the Bible or the Scriptures, right? But there's many applications, so a lot of things that maybe were written to Hebrew believers, but we can apply to our lives today. And so we, of course, want to be careful to do that, and we always want to be very careful when we preach or teach anything from the Bible and make sure that we're keeping it within the context and, of course, uh, preaching the whole counsel of God. We want to learn something, and we want to be not just reading the Bible and studying the Bible. We want to be doers of God's Word. Amen? So that's what the object is. So we'll have many lessons, and the book we'll look at in a little while. But let's go ahead and read that first, and then we'll jump right into it. I have uh, lesson one here. This is the first one, of course, and I have lots of notes. <laughs> So, as always, if it's, I'm looking at the clock back there, if it gets to be a little late, we may just cut it off at a certain point. We don't want to keep you here, because we have service tonight as well. So let's go ahead. Uh, the Epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 1, we're going to read just verses 1, 2, and 3, all right? The Bible says this, God's Word says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. I know there's a semicolon there. I know that. And we have uh, many other things. This is all one sentence, and we're going to continue on, but not today. All right? In fact, we may not finish this today. But let's go ahead and, and get into this book. You know, and I don't want to get into too many of the details about the epistle, but some of them I do. So the author of this book, many believe, and I believe it's the Apostle Paul. But there are some commentators that believe it could be Apollos, remember Apollos is mentioned in the New Testament as one as was eloquent in the scriptures. Could have been Barnabas, they believe, one that took Saul of Tarsus under his wing and brought him into the New Testament church. Of course, his name now Paul could have been Luke, the writer of the book of Acts and the Gospel of Luke and several others. But one thing is the little evidence that does exist. Now it doesn't say I, Paul, you know, so it doesn't mention his name or any other name, but because of the style of writing and certain things, uh, what little evidence there is in this letter compared to uh, Paul's other letters, it all points to his uh, authorship. Now, the author of the scriptures is God's Holy Spirit, right? We know that it's inspired and it's God's word, not Paul's word, but the human penman. We just, again, I personally believe and according to all that I've studied and of course most of you as well believe it was Paul. Can we be dogmatic about that? No, but uh, again, we'll find out when we get to heaven. <laughs> the date of the writing. Now, here's the thing. A lot of things happened before 70 AD, which was, you know, the destruction of the temple. And so because of certain things, commentators, again, believe uh, they don't know the exact year, but it's somewhere between 64 through 67 AD. In other words, before AD 70. To whom? To whom the book was written? Well, because of the name, right? Again, the specific recipients uh, are not named, like Paul wrote Timothy, and you know it was written to young Timothy, right? But most commentators, again, believe it's written to Jewish believers. These are born again, trusting Christ, again, as their Savior, as the Messiah. And so Jewish believers, Hebrew Christians, you could say. 
<laughs> Albert Barnes, who I, uh, is one of the commentaries that I read a lot, says this about the recipients of who this is written to. He said, the main object of this epistle is to commend the Christian faith to those who are dressed in it. And again, you look at the first verse here, it says, God who spoke in sundry times, diverse manners to who? To the fathers. It's talking about the fathers or the patriarchs of the nation of Israel. So we know that. And also it's written to them in such a way as to prevent, listen, their defection from the Christian faith. A lot of these uh, Hebrews, these believers, these Jewish believers had a tendency to fall back into Judaism because they grew up in that and they have the history of it. So this was written to prevent them from falling back into, it would be like Paul going back into Judaism as a Pharisee. All right, and then how did they do that? Well, Albert Barnes says it's done by showing the superiority of the Christian system, what Christ has done compared to the Old Testament law and the Mosaic system. And the great danger of the Christians and these believers, these Jewish believers in, in, the, in, the, in the land of Israel and Palestine was to relapse back into the Jewish system because of its nature of its rites, you know, its feasts, the, the, the antiquity of it, the age Again, thousands of years old, and again, there would tend to be a, a relapse. So to counteract this, the writer, Paul, we believe of this epistle, shows that the gospel in the New Testament has higher claims on their attention. Uh, again, and, and beginning here in the first chapter, we're going to talk about, you're going to see that this word better is used 13 times in this book. And today we'll see Jesus is better than the prophets, but that's just one of the 13. And so the drift of chapter, especially chapter one, is to show the dignity, the exalted nature of the author of the Christian system, which is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And so the purpose of the epistle is to show the Old Testament seed, what was in seed form, is fully developed in the New Testament, and no, no reason to go back to Judaism. We always tell Jewish people that we witness to that Christianity is the fulfillment of Judaism. There's no reason. I had a, a Jewish uh, woman in Knoxville, Tennessee, when I was in the seminary there uh, that was afraid. And Jews have this fear. If they, if they join uh, and become a Christian, they think they've lost their Jewishness. And of course, because of persecution, they rightfully have uh, a fear of that. And we said, no, I said, the, you become a completed Jew. Uh, you've gone all the way from the Old Testament and the prophecies. Now you trust Christ as the Messiah. There's nothing wrong. All Jews should be believers in Christ. Amen? Christianity is Jewish in its roots. Jesus was Jewish. Most of the writers of the Bible that God used were Jews that he spoke to. So three reasons for the purpose of this epistle to the Hebrews is first, to show God is fulfilling his Old Testament covenant by giving all men, Jew and Gentile, Jew and non-Jew, a new covenant, a better covenant, a fulfillment of the old covenant, if you would. Second, to give Again, a strong word of exhortation to Jewish believers and really to all believers because the Jews, even believers in Christ that were Jewish, suffered, as we do still to this day, persecution. So it was written to encourage and third, to give a strong word of warning because it mentions many, uh, a lot of verses in here about the end times, the last days, which uh, I believe we're living in right now. Amen? So just a little background and again... The Jewish believers and Jews today, even that still practice Judaism, are always having a tough time. And, and ones that were saved now, <laughs> born-again Jews, had, had this tension and between the new Christian faith and their thousands of years of indoctrination in the faith of Judaism. And so they not only faced, uh, again, these New Testament that he was writing to born-again Jews, they not, not only faced day-to-day -day like we do, worldliness and selfishness and sin, but they face the old enslavement of, of a religion that was steeped in ritual and formalism. Jesus told the Jews of his day, you make the word of God of none effect, right, by your tradition. So they took God's word and they, they changed it and made you know, a religious system out of it that God never intended. He intended the Jews to make himself known, to make God known to a lost and dying world. That's the Old Testament. In the New Testament, God used the church, the ecclesia, the called out assembly to make himself known in this world, both Jew and Gentile, all right? So there's 
something to think about as we're going through the book. There's six parts of Hebrews. We're going to break it down and start first, first part today is that the supreme revelation is Jesus Christ, God's son. Uh, the supreme high priest, we're going to look at point two. The supreme minister is all about Christ. The supreme author of our faith and the supreme example of endurance, how he endured the cross. And then last, the supreme marks of Christian conduct, which will affect, again, both Jew and Gentile. So let's, let's look at today Christ's supremacy as the Son of God, the supreme revelation. And, you know, here's the thing. Man, humans, have always had, and, and this is something God puts in us, a, a drive to live. You know, God made us in his image and likeness. We were made, in the beginning, Adam and Eve, to live eternally. So they had eternal physical life and, of course, an eternal soul, which is spiritual life. Of course, we know sin cut us off from God. Sin separates us from God. And so we have now physical death. Uh, Romans says it very well. Wherefore, as by one man, Romans 5, 12, what happened? Sin entered into Adam. The first man sinned. And so death by sin, uh, by, because of sin, death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. We're all sinners because of the original sin of Adam. But man, since then, is looking uh, inside and out to find if there is a God and to find out how to find his approval and acceptance. And they do it in different ways. The great tragedy, however, is this. That men have grasped and groped and sought after God as though they're in a dark cave looking for the light. Um, there's no need to be in the dark about God. You know why? Because God has revealed himself. God uh, didn't want to go and hide away and never allow man to find out who he was. He revealed himself in many ways. Through, we know through creation, in Romans, it talks about that in the first chapter. Not enough to be saved, but enough to know there's a God, there's a creator. Through conscience, that's an inner witness that, that there's a God, again, and, and knowing right from wrong. Again, not enough to save you, but to know there's a higher being, there's a God. And then through his prophets, as we're going to see here, in sundry times and diverse manners, he spoke to men in the past by, the, by his prophets. This, again, speaking of Old Testament prophets, and now today... He speaks to us through his word and through the living word, Christ himself. And so God revealed himself. And the true way, again, to know about a person, and just like we meet new people, we want to know about a person, we want to have a, what, a relationship. Uh, a, a, not just saying hi to somebody, but discussing and talking with them. Uh, <laughs> When we were away in Montana, I, I haven't seen my cousin. I've seen them. My one cousin, Matthew, came to my wedding here in Hawaii. Uh, his daughter, Sarah, was recently here with another girl. Remember those two girls that came from Montana? She is my cousin's daughter. She was there, of course. But most of his kids I didn't meet. meet and they, they're all asking us, me and Terry, tell us how you met. Tell us how come you're in Hawaii. You know, the whole story. And so, <laughs> I, I don't know. Every time I tell the story, I try to make it more like a Reader's Digest convinced. But there's so, certain events you can't leave out in the story. So one night, we're, it gets dark in Montana, like 11 o'clock at night. One night after dinner, I thought it was like 7 o'clock. I'm over there talking and telling the story. And I look at my watch, and I said, it's almost 11 o'clock. We've got to get, get up early tomorrow. I want to get to bed. But the relationship with us, among others, you know, is one of discussing and talking, going out to dinner together, getting... Of course, you have the human family relationship, some of mother and a child, a father and a child. But when it comes to God, he wants us to know him, not just facts about him, but a personal relationship. I, I grew up in Italian-American in New Jersey. Yeah! Okay. As a Roman Catholic. I had no choice. Uh, that's what my family was, and that's what I became, and I went to Catholic school and altar boy and the whole thing, and uh, I thought I was fine. We were taught, you know, as long as you follow the rules, <laughs> do these certain things, uh, you'll be uh, going to heaven. Again, uh, that's not what the Bible teaches, but that's what I was taught. And anyway, I went through all of that until I was 27. I didn't what I consider. I had a bunch of facts. I had a head knowledge, right, we say, but I didn't have a heart salvation, knowing Christ is my personal Savior. Seeing, in fact, when the lady asked me if I died, if I go to heaven, I said, yeah, <laughs> and ignorantly. Why? Well, I'm a Catholic. I've done all the things I know how to do in my religion. But I knew after I studied God's Word a little bit with her, 
that I would be like any other person. I'm a sinner by birth and by choice, and I would go separated from God into a place called hell. And so 27, born again, trusted Christ, prayed, received Christ as my Savior. Well, that's a relationship. What's the relationship? John chapter 1, verse 12. As many as received him, he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So I was God's child in the true sense. We're all God's children, not true. We're all God's creation. We become a child of God by a special supernatural spiritual birth. And so to get to know God personally, again, man seeking. We were seeking before we got saved. Maybe you uh, people in here, some of you could give a testimony of your search for the truth. And finally, again, with me, it was a person that came to me and shared Christ. I knew another person read the Gospel of John, was able to trust Christ after reading the Bible. Faith comes by hearing, right? Hearing by the Word of God. Everyone comes to a saving knowledge of Christ, sometimes in a different way. But now, he's revealed himself to us. And usually, again, mostly, and again, in my case, through a woman, but through his Word. She shared the Bible with me. And once I saw the truth of the Word of God, it was like a light <laughs> went on. And so Jesus, again, the point of this whole book, and we're going to see especially the first four chapters of Hebrews, the supreme revelation of God. Again, we believe in what we call them doctrinally, the deity of Christ. God incarnate. The Word, as John says in chapter 1 of the Gospel of John, became flesh and dwelt among us. So, in the Old Testament, again, he mentions here in this first verse, the prophets of God, the Old Testament prophets. These were great men of God. God used them as messengers, and we've seen they were very special servants. They had a special message to give, like Habakkuk that we just finished, and they could tell others how to become acceptable, what we had to do. And as men, they could tell others how to live and how to please God. These were great men. They were men whom God spoke and whom God entrusted. Imagine that, his message. But as great as they were, these Old Testament prophets, and they were great, they fade to insignificance. You say, what? Compared to Christ. God's very own son. Christ is far, far superior. We're going to see the many things, but in this lesson, to the prophets. He's better than the prophets. And so uh, we'll start off today. I'm looking at the clock already, and I didn't even get to point one. So I have eight points here. We might get four today, maybe three. Number one, number one here is Jesus Christ is the supreme. This is why he's greater than the prophets. He's the supreme spokesman of God. Look at, look at verse one and two again. God, who at sundry times and in a diverse manner spake in time past. Right? I'm not trying to add words to the Bible, but just to comment on it. In time past, the Old Testament, I ears, unto the fathers. Again, Old Testament prophets, and it mentions it again, by the prophets. He spoke to the Old Testament fathers, the patriarchs, you know, the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He hath now, in verse 2 now, what is he? He hath spoken in these last days, and again, most of the New Testament saints believe they were living in the last days, right? He hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. The first reason why he's superior or better than the prophets is God has spoken to man through Christ. God has spoken to man. He's not, as most people would think of, as a God that's a statue, dead, cold, right? Like Paul said to the to those uh, philosophers, the unknown God. No, he's not like that. He's not far off in the distance, uh, someplace in outer space, so far away that how could he be concerned with what's happening in our lives? He is, of course, concerned. The things we go through, the trials we go through, the struggles we go through, and all that happens to us. And so God has spoken to us. <laughs> he's given us the wonderful words of life and deliverance. He's told us exactly how to conquer trials and temptations and corruption and the death of this world. And then this is the question, when did God speak to man? And where can we find the record? If God's not really far off in outer space somewhere in the distance, uncaring, if God really has spoken to man, well, we have to find out where it is and heed what he said, for his word could mean either everlasting life and victory or everlasting death and separation. 
Where is it? Where is it found? Well, two places, he says here in verse 1. God's word's found in the Old Testament prophets. We have, as we know, 66 books of the canon, we call it, of Scripture that made it into the completed work. 39 in the Old, 27 in the New. He's talking about here the Old Testament, ancient times. God spoke to man by his prophets. That those are people, persons, whom he chose to proclaim his word to the world. Who are they? Well, they're men and women of the Old Testament scriptures. God spoke through the prophets. He said what? At sundry times. That means at many different times. It means in many different pieces or parts or in many separate revelations. That's what it means when he says sundry times. So he spoke to the prophets in, in, in many different times. Again, according to years, you could say, or thousands of years in the case here. And not only that, he spoke in diverse manners. He spoke in many different times, and diverse manners means many different ways. All right? What this means is this. Look, no man or woman could receive and understand the whole revelation of God in one shot. All right? God and the truth of God is too big for any one man or woman. So God had to make, again, sundry times and diverse manners. He spoke to different people in different ways. No man or woman could ever contain or share this whole Old Testament revelation of God. Matthew Henry, you ever read Matthew Henry's commentaries? Uh, like reading Charles Spurgeon, a little, little difficult. He states it well here, is what he had to say. He said there had to be a gradual opening of man's understanding concerning the Messiah, the Savior of the world. All right, so that's why sundry times, diverse manners. Uh, just a couple of quick examples here of some people that God used these sundry times. He spoke to Adam, Genesis chapter 3, and told him a Savior would come from the seed of a woman. That was one, all right, one time. He spoke to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 and told him the Savior would come from his seed. And so Adam, he said it would come from the seed of a woman, now specifically through Adam, I'm through Abraham, as we know, through the lion of the tribe of Judah. This is why that's so important. Jacob, God spoke to uh, Jacob and told him the Savior would come through the tribe of Judah, Genesis chapter 49, verse 10. God spoke to David, told him the Savior would be born of his house, right? God spoke to Micah, the Old Testament prophet Micah, in chapter 5, verse 2, the place he would be born, Bethlehem. And then God spoke to, um, not just, these are just a few, all right? Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, he would be born of a virgin. So these are the different people, but he spoke in different ways, sundry and diverse manners. Remember, he spoke to Moses uh, on, on the mount, getting the law through a thundering voice. He spoke to Moses as well through what? A burning bush. <laughs> but he spoke to him. He spoke to Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19 by a still small voice. He spoke to Isaiah in a vision, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 1. Remember the vision he had, a guy high and holy and lifted up? He spoke to Samuel in a dream in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 5. And again, on and on uh, we can go. God spoke to his prophets in many different ways. But here's the point. Each prophet could present only a part of God's revelation. No one of them individually could present the whole thing. Uh, the full revelation of God is not found in the prophet's Alone, all right, that's just part of it. The second point is, God's spoken to us, as it says here, by his son. By his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the most astounding uh, truth imaginable. For God could send no greater messenger, again, the Old Testament prophets, great, great men of God that God used in a great way, but no greater messenger than uh, to send his word with than his very own son. In fact, again, we believe God himself in flesh. And this is a declaration of this passage. God sent his son to proclaim his word to men. Before Christ, no man could fully grasp or fully understand God. No man could fully proclaim the word of God. We had a part, we had a fragment of the knowledge of God. But now God's very own son, Jesus, has come to earth and revealed God, proclaiming all that God is. And so we always say this, we need no further revelation. We have God's completed word. And so it's he himself, Jesus, who is the revelation of God. He embodies the word of God. He, he is the word of God. 
Everything God ever wanted to say to man is said in the actual person of Jesus Christ. He's the perfect expression of God's mind. Everything man needs to know about God, all right, we can know again through Christ. And so, very important, again, this writing in Hebrews, I know we, we say it's to the born again or the Jew, the saved Jew that has gone from Judaism to, the, to Christianity, which really isn't, uh, looking at the Bible, should be a very easy, it's the completion, it's the fulfillment of it. Number two, Jesus is appointed heir of all things. Uh, look again at verse 1 and 2 here. It says, he had spoken in these last days, I'm sorry, verse 2, by his son, whom God, he hath appointed, what? Heir of all things. He's an heir of all things. Nice to be an heir, wasn't it? He had a rich uncle or an aunt uh, pass away, and they have, of course, the reading of the will, and you find out you're in there, and they ask you to come to the lawyer's office and Remember Jackie Gleason, uh, one of the episodes, he got a note saying, please meet us in the lawyer's office here, the heir to fortune. And of course, Jack Gleason went to work, and he told off his boss, who he's wanted to tell off for years, and he got fired, and he said, God, I didn't want to be here anymore anyway, and he told Alice, and she's like, what are you doing? Allie, I got the letter here, fortune. And remember, they go to the will, you remember that show? I don't know if you've seen that one. And here he is. Uh, Mr., I don't know what the guy's name was, we'll say Mr. Smith has left to his bus driver, Ralph Cramden, his fortune. And Jackie Gleason goes, ah, Norton, I told you. And all of a sudden they take out this bird cage, and here is the bird named Fortune. <laughs> and Jackie Gleason, of course, whoa. And he passes out and he has to go apologize and get his job back. Anyway, an heir. <laughs> The second reason that Jesus is superior to the Old Testament prophet is he, God has made him an heir to all things. What do we mean by that? It means Jesus was to receive and be the owner, lawful owner, of all things. Uh, if you have an amplified New Testament, I don't. It'll say that in there. He's the lawful owner, the heir of all things. He alone, Jesus, has inherited all God is and has in himself. No man, again, no other man, is great enough or woman worthy enough to be an heir of God, only Christ. He alone has lived, walked perfectly before God. Nobody else could say that. Among men, he alone has obeyed God perfectly. I, I wish we could say that. And so therefore, he alone has inherited all that God is and all that God has. He's an heir of all things. He alone has been appointed to be the owner or the heir of all. That's why he's greater no, no Old Testament prophet can ever proclaim to be an heir of God. Third, moving quite right along here, he's the creator and maker of the worlds. Again, verse 2. He has in these last days, God has spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, and by whom also he made the worlds. I'll stop after this point, all right? Jesus is the creator and maker of the world. And it says, what is that? Plural there, right? All the worlds. This is the third reason why he's superior and better than the prophets. The word worlds here is translated as ages. Jesus Christ, the creator of the universe and the ages that roll in one upon the other. Creation of worlds and time as it moves forward from event to event, from generation to generation. Jesus is the author of that. The point is this, creation here means and includes all the worlds, all dimensions of life and being, wherever they are and however they may be. I know uh, that they had a sent the spaceship, finally got to Mars, you know, and they're looking for life there. And uh, there's no, <laughs> no life, I don't think, there. <laughs> there's a big thing lately, I don't know if you've uh, seen it in the news, when you go through all the garbage that's out there about the vaccine and Joe Biden and... Uh, <laughs> UFOs. Uh, you know, I, when I was growing up, we, we always wondered about that, right? There was a UFO spotted, unidentified in our house. We didn't have a UFO. We just had a flying objects. We had slippers thrown at us, wooden spoons thrown at us. This is an unidentified flying object. And the point is this, though. Creation be all the worlds. This is exactly what is meant by the plural worlds. You know, listen, Colossians 1.16 says, Christ created all things that are in heaven, in the earth, visible and invisible, whether you can see them or not, whether they are thrones, dimensions, principalities, 
or powers. Listen, if there are other visible planets and living things, you know what? Christ created them. If there's invisible worlds and beings in other dimensions, which I don't believe there are, but if there is, Christ created them. He whom also hath made the worlds. It doesn't matter what kind of worlds or created beings, it's thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers. Christ created them all. In other words, there's nothing in existence that he did not create. Uh, that's John chapter 1, verse 3. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Jesus was there. In fact, if you look in Genesis, when God created, it's a pluralized word. We believe God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit of God are all co-equal, all co-existent, all right, eternally exist. In other words, there's never a time. We know God doesn't have a beginning and ending. Well, Jesus doesn't have a beginning and ending. The Holy Spirit of God doesn't have a beginning and an ending. They're all co-equal, co-existent, and eternally existent. This is important when we talk about Christ. And this is what the cults don't understand uh, about the deity of Christ. Oh, he was just a good man. He was just a prophet. He was a teacher, a rabbi. No, he was God incarnate, all right? And uh, we have God revealed himself in these last days, and we're definitely in the last days, through his son. So he's spoken to us by his son, as verse 2 says. He appointed him heir of all things, and again, creation. And the, we go to Romans, which we had finished uh, several months ago, about creation. It's enough to let us know there is a creator, but not enough for salvation. Uh, people are, say, says in, in Romans, are without what excuse? People are going to go stand before God someday, and because they didn't trust Christ, they're going to be separated from God, what the Bible calls the second death. Death number one is a physical death. We die, our body goes to the grave or cremated, whatever. Our soul lives on forever in one of two places, heaven and hell. In Revelation, it says when you go to hell, you're separated from God. The Bible calls that the second death. It's a spiritual death. Both are separations, whether it's physical or spiritual. Christ made a way so we can reconnect. We're born again because, because of sin. We're spiritually dead. We have a body with five senses. We have a soul. That makes us all individual souls. And then when we get saved, we have the third part, spirit. Uh, when I, before I was saved, I used to con get confused with soul and spirit. No, they're different when we're talking about. We all have a soul. We're individual souls made in God's image. We have a, a soul that lives forever. It's immortal. Where you live after you leave this world depends on your relationship to God through Christ. And so when you die without Christ and you're in hell, you're separated from God for how long? All eternity. Terrible thing. We always say if you've been born once, you celebrate your birthday every year, right? Physical birth. We all have that. If you've been born only once, that's all you celebrate is your physical birthday. You'll die twice. You have the physical death and a spiritual death. But if you've been born twice, Physically and spiritually, you'll die only once. And hopefully, if the Lord comes and raptures us to heaven, we might not even have to face that. Amen? <laughs> Jesus Christ, the Creator. Well, there's several more points here. We, we don't want to go into that today because we'll be here for another at least 40 minutes. So we'll save that for next Sunday, August 1st, first Sunday of the month. I, I want to ask you this. As we study this book... Don't think of yourself, well, this is for the Hebrew Christian, and mainly it is, but there's so much uh, powerful scripture here that Paul wrote, again, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, that applies to us as well. And we'll see that as we get into the study about the Word. But the main thing, Jesus is better. <laughs> better than anything, better than any religion, even, again, Judaism, which uh, God used, again, to make himself known in the world through the nation of Israel. Their purpose, again, in making God known was to bring... Remember, you know, when they built the temple and they had the tabernacle, which could be, say, a traveling temple? They always had the court of the, what, Gentiles. They were supposed to allow uh, even non-Jews, in other words, to see what was going on. You know, the plagues that God sent to Egypt so that the Pharaoh would allow, allow the people to go it was an attempt to even the, for the Egyptians to know there was a God. And I always go back to David and Goliath when David charged at this giant Philistine Goliath. He said that all the earth may know, what? That there's a God in Israel. God wants to make himself known. And in the New Testament, he uses us. Born again, Jew and Gentile. The church, 
We live in the, the age of the church. Uh, I don't know if you believe in dispensations or not, different periods of time. The Old Testament dispensation was the law. New Testament dispensation, we believe, of grace. A little difference there. And then we're saved by grace, not in keeping the law. We study that a lot in Romans. If you're here this morning, you must trust Christ. God's only begotten Son. God made a way where he came to this earth as a man, lived a sinless life, died for the sins of the world with his life. He gave his life. He gave his precious blood on the cross. He said the last words in the Gospel of John that Jesus said was, it is what? Finished. That word means it's been paid in full. The debt for the sins of all of man. But not all men and women are going to be saved just because of what Jesus is. It's not an automatic pass into heaven. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace, God's good grace, free gift, for by grace are you saved through faith. It's, it's the object of your faith. For by grace you're saved through faith. That, not of yourselves, it's not even your own faith. It's a gift of God, lest any man should boast. In other words, we're given a free gift, not of works. I, brought, I was brought up in a religious system that taught doing this and that, and the other thing would get you points to get into heaven, you know? There's no points. There's only one way to heaven. Jesus said it. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And I encourage you, if you're here today, we're going through Hebrews. I know that. But more importantly is your relationship. Have you trusted in the one that God spoke about in these last days that is appointed heir of all things and creator of all that we see and know? If you're not trusting Christ, you're trusting something. <laughs> You're trusting yourself, your good works, your religion, whatever that may be. It's not about religion. It's about, again, we said earlier, relationship with him. If you haven't trusted Christ, we're going to sing in a moment. Brother John's coming back up. We're going to sing a hymn. It's a chance for you just to think, meditate about what God's word said. God's spirit uh, wants to draw sinners to him. If you're here today and haven't trusted Christ as your savior, you need a savior. You need a, a deliverer. You need one who's died in place of you to pay for your penalty, which he did over 2,000 years ago. It's already done. <laughs> Jesus paid it all, we sing, right? All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. What did he do? He washed it white as snow, as if it was never there. I was saved when I was 27. If you're here this morning, you've never trusted Christ. Make sure you see one of us, one of the men here, the elders, if you're a woman, one of our ladies would love to share with you in the Bible what God's Word says about salvation. And so let's pray a closing prayer. Thank all you folks that are watching us on YouTube Live and those of you who are here today and uh, visitors, uh, Suzanne's uh, family there, future family. Let's go ahead and close and then uh, Brother John will come and we'll sing a closing hymn. Father, thank you. As we study this uh, new epistle, Lord, I pray you'd speak to us by your spirit to see uh, what we've done, what Christ has done, what you have done through him, Lord, to make salvation available. And it truly is better Lord, than anything, even Judaism, Lord, it's the completion of it, it's the fulfillment of it, and we pray for it, born again Christians and Jews to reach out to lost Jews and Gentiles that would have an understanding of faith in Christ, what it means, Lord. You've done it all the work. We simply, by faith, come and trust Christ and what he's already done. So help us, help those here that maybe do not know Christ, so become a child of God by faith. Bless this time and the rest of the day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.